Good morning, Rise, or good afternoon, Rise, if you're watching this this in the afternoon. How are you? Have you had a good week in the snow? Have you built a snowman? If you have, you maybe you want to send us your pictures of what you've been up to in the snow. Now, this week is our last week in the book of Acts. And we've been through Acts for quite a long time. We started, you might remember, right before Christmas in November. And we looked at the first half of the book of Acts, mainly looking at Peter. And then after Christmas, we... And then after Christmas, we came back. And this second half, we mainly looked at the book, the story of Paul. Now, this is our last story, and we are looking at Paul again. And we are looking right towards the end of the book of Acts. Our stories this week are Acts 27 and Acts 28. And the videos below, which you can check, and Acts 28. But I'm going to read from our book one last time, and I'm going to just read Acts 27 this week. And Acts 27 is all about a shipwreck. So this chapter is called The Big Beastie Blower. The, the Big Beastie Blower. So Festus and Agrippa told Paul that he'd have to go to Rome. They sent a big, strong and muscly guard called Julius along too to make sure that Paul and a bunch of other random prisoners didn't escape. This was going to be our longest journey yet. The boat we got on was a rather slow one. It stopped nearly every town along the way. The first place we stopped at was called Sidon and we knew that Paul had some friends there who would want to help him. Muscly Julius was also rather a nice man and he let Paul go and say hi to his friends as long as he come, promised to come straight back. So Paul was a prisoner at this point. Our journey really wasn't going well. The wind kept blowing us the wrong way and it was as if we were constantly fighting against the sea. It was pretty rough and lots of people were being sick. Ew. Eventually, we stopped in a place called Myra and Julius decided we should try a different boat. It took a while, but in the end, we found places on a boat that was going to Italy. But the new boat really wasn't much better. In fact, the weather was more of the problem than the boat. But either way, there was plenty more puking on this leg of the journey. We ended up having to take a totally ridiculous route because every time we tried to get to land, we got blown way back out again. It seemed to be getting worse and worse and Paul told everyone the journey was going to be so bad that the people would die and the boat would be ruined. I'm guessing he wasn't feeling so great, what with the stormy weather and everything, but I wasn't expecting him to be the voice of doom. Julius was obviously feeling a bit more positive and ignored Paul completely. Awkward. He decided that the captain of the boat knew what was what he was doing and agreed with him that they should keep on going, at least to Crete. There was a pretty decent harbour in a place called Phoenix on the island of Crete, where we'll be able to tie up the boat and wait out the worst of the weather. But even that didn't go to plan. The strongest wind I've ever known was blowing and blowing and blowing. And no matter how hard we tried, we just couldn't go in the direction we wanted. All the boaty people called it the North Easter, and I think I might just call it the Big Beastie Blower. It was all starting to get pretty scary. My knees were knocking and everyone looked terrified. Even the proper boaty people who'd done this journey loads of times before were worried. They pulled in our little spare lifeboat that we towed along because they wanted to keep it safe. And then they did something that got me even more worried than ever. They actually started to tie the boat together. They had super long ropes that they tied all the way around the ship from the top to the bottom. They even dropped the anchor. I mean, I thought that's what you did when you wanted to stop the boat, but apparently it can help you slow it down and stop it blowing over 
when there's a massive storm like this one. But it didn't get any better. We ended up having to throw boxes of food and material and other things that we were taking to Italy into the sea. They were making the boat too heavy and they kept flying around all over the place and hitting people. I have to say, this was literally the worst boat journey of my life. I couldn't wait for it to be over. But it got even worse. The captain told the crew to throw everything else into the sea as well. All their boaty bits and pieces, spare ropes, buckets, scrubbing brushes, barrels of fish biscuits and anything else that wasn't fastened down. The sky was so dark and the sea was so rough that we couldn't even tell if it was night or day. And in the end, we gave up. We were pretty certain we were all going to die. To be honest, I was way past being scared. I just wanted it all to stop, but it didn't. It went on and on for days and days and days. And all the people on the boat just sat on the deck looking pretty awful. Most of us had tied ourselves onto something that looked strong enough to stop us from being thrown into the sea. And then Paul decided it was time for a little speech. It was hard to hear him over the noise of the storm, but I think this is what he said. <coughs> I told you this wasn't going to go well. Well, don't, I think we figured that one out, Paul. Can't you say something a bit more helpful? This wouldn't have happened if you'd listened to me. Uh, no, that's not what I was hoping for. Be strong and brave. You will all be okay. The ship won't be, but you will. That's more like it, Paul. God sent an angel to speak to me last night. He told me not to be afraid and said that I will get to see Caesar. He told me that you'd all survive this storm. So keep going. I know God always keeps his promises. He'll keep us safe. But I think we might have to crash on an island shortly. That was a pretty good speech once he got going. And until he mentioned the crash on the island bit. But I suppose crashing on an island and being alive is better than sinking on a boat and being not so alive. Anyway, after we'd been tossed around for two whole weeks, the captain said he thought we might be getting near some land. So the crew kept checking how deep the water was. And sure enough, it was getting shallower and shallower. Everyone started freaking out and throwing all the anchors they could find off the boat so it would stop before we hit something and a few people even threw the lifeboat back into the sea. They told everyone they were just throwing over more anchors, but really they were trying to figure out if they could use the lifeboat to escape. Paul told Muscly Julius and a few of the others that everyone had to stay on the boat and that if anyone left, God wouldn't keep us safe. So Julius went and found the ropes that attached the lifeboat to the big boat and cut them. Then he stood there and watched the lifeboat float away until he couldn't see it anymore. Awesome! The people who were planning to escape were pretty peeved, but there was nothing they could do about it now. Just before sunrise, Paul decided it was time for some food. We hadn't eaten for weeks and everyone looked terrible. Even muscly Julius wasn't looking quite so muscly anymore. I thought we'd thrown all the food in the sea, but Paul seemed to produce bread from somewhere. I so good. You've all been freaked out for days and days, he said. You haven't eaten anything, but you really need to eat something now or you'll starve. You will all be okay. Then he said thank you to God for the bread and shared it out. Everyone stared. They were so amazed to see food that they almost didn't dare eat it. Paul, 176 of us. After we'd eaten, we were proper podged. We decided we wouldn't be needing any more flour to make more bread, so we threw that in the sea too. Honestly, I'm sure there couldn't possibly be anything at all left on the boat now, could there? Eventually, the clouds cleared a little and we could see a beach with white sand. 
It was quite a nice beach, really. One that would have been great for a day out if you weren't with a bunch of totally exhausted people. The captain aimed for the beach and told everyone to cut the anchors loose and put up the biggest sail so that the wind would blow us into the sand. The captain had a pretty good aim and we were doing well. But then we suddenly came to a crunching, cracking, creaking stop. We had managed to get stuck on a big pile of sand on the bottom of the sea and the beach was quite a way off. Then the back of the ship started falling apart and the sea grabbed hold of all the pieces and took them away. Ah! The other prisoners who had been sent with Paul looking like they were thinking of escape, escape looked like they were thinking of trying to escape and a few of the guards wanted to kill them but not so muscly now Julius, managed to convince the guards that this was a stupid idea and instead told everyone to swim for the beach in the distance. But not everyone could swim. Oops. The swimmers went for it. They used every last bit of energy they had to fight through the waves and get to the beach. The not swimmers grabbed bits of boat before it all got washed away and used them like big floats. I grabbed a big long plank and lay down on it and used my arms and legs like big paddles. That worked pretty well. Maybe I should consider becoming a boat in future. Believe it or not, everyone made it to the beach. Wow. Everyone except for the boat. I hope that you enjoyed that story today. And if you want to read the whole of this book or read some more of this book, you are welcome to borrow it if you want to read about Peter and Paul's story. It's a really good retelling of the book of Acts for children. So in that story, Paul and the, ship and the shipmates were in a storm. And I wonder if you've ever been in a storm, if you've been in the car or been walking and it's been raining and stormy. What's it like? It's very wet, isn't it? And I know that when it is... Um, if we've been on a boat and the sea is rough, that can be quite scary. I wonder if you've ever been on a boat as well. I have, and I must admit that I don't really like going on boats. It makes me feel a bit sick. So I can imagine there was lots of people being sick on this boat and probably a lot of people being scared. But when we face difficulty and when we're scared, we need to remember that we are never alone. If we are Christians, the Holy Spirit lives in our heart and is always with us. And God is also Paul to believe God's promises. His faith in God helped him to encourage the other passengers on the boat in a difficult time. And when we're in a frightening situation, sometimes it's easier to help ourselves and focus on ourselves rather than on other people or to trust in God. But Paul helped others before he helped himself. And that's how we need to be. We need to put other people before ourselves. Maybe if you're in a situation like a shipwreck, it might be important. It's important to make sure you're safe first as well, though. But I don't think hopefully none of you are ever going to be in a shipwreck. But the Holy Spirit helped Paul to have courage and to trust God in a very frightening situation. And his example helped the passengers to learn that they could trust in God. And throughout this book of Acts that we've been looking at, we've seen lots of examples of how the first believers in Jesus followed God and obeyed his will. But did they do it on their own? No. God sent the Holy Spirit to help the believers. And this is how God spoke to them. If we believe in Jesus, and if we have asked Jesus to live inside of us, then God has also sent his Holy Spirit to you to help you too. Because Paul was an obedient servant, many lives were touched by the power of God. And God had a plan and a purpose for Paul's life. And no difficulty was going to stop that God's purpose for Paul. As God's purpose for Paul was being fulfilled, other lives were being blessed and touched by God and changed for the better as well. And today, guys, I want to tell you that God has a plan and a purpose for each of you and each one of us. If you believe in Jesus and you believe in God and have asked Jesus into your heart, Jesus and God will send the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit is a person to live inside your heart and help you fulfill that purpose in your life. 
God wants your faith to grow so that you can be a strong witness to share Christ with others. That just means so that you can share God and Jesus' love with other people. As Christians, we will face difficulties sometimes. As people, we face difficulties, but God never leaves us in those difficulties. The Holy Spirit helps us to encourage others to turn to God and trust him. Maybe you might be like some of the other people on that ship sailing to Rome. You might have gone through a very difficult time in your life and you're scared, or you might be going through a difficult time. But you don't have to go through this time alone. You've got to believe that God will help you. Maybe you're not a believer yet. Maybe you haven't asked Jesus into your heart yet. And that's okay. But I want you to know that God sent Jesus to die for your sins so that you can have a relationship and a friendship with God. And when you believe in Jesus, you are um, adopted or taken into God's family And you'll never be alone because the Holy Spirit will live in your heart. And he will give you the strength and courage as you face different circumstances in your life. Now, if you want to talk about any of this, you can talk to one of your adults at home or an um, older brother or sister. Or you can get in touch with me and I'm happy to talk to you about it. We can have a phone call or a call online or something. Now, we're going to pray This has been quite a long talk today, but I really wanted to share with you and remind you guys that God is with you, even when you go through difficulty. And even in this time of COVID-19 and lockdown, that God is with you and he loves you. So I'm going to pray for you all now. I'd love for you to join in. Father God, I want to thank you for these children, these young people and whoever may be watching this video. I thank you that you know them and that you love them. And I thank you that you have got a good purpose for their life and a good plan for their life. Lord, I want to pray that those children who know you already will be able to put their trust in you even further and be able to trust that you are with them and help them. And Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit, he will be with those children as they go through their lives and help them to share your love with other people. Father, I want to pray for those who are not friends with you yet. Lord, I just pray that um, you will work in their hearts and that they will come to know and trust in you and that they will come to love you. Lord, I pray that you will be with us all when we go through difficult times, that we don't have to be frightened or feel alone because you are always with us. Lord, I pray for these children this week and young people. I pray that you'll be with them as they go through the week and enjoy half term and know that you are with them in all that they do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, be great to speak to you guys soon. And maybe some of you might want to join in with our Family Connect event this afternoon or you might want to watch it on the YouTube channel um, on Catch Up. And that's great. So hopefully we'll see some of you guys there. And if not, I'll speak to you again next week. Bye-bye.